Praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath. Good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it, on another Sabbath day? You know, not knowing how many more we have in this life, freedoms that we have, we need to really enjoy them. Thank God for every one that we have. In fact, you know, begin to thank God for every morning we wake up, for the health and strength that we have, for usually when it's gone or deteriorating, then we begin to think about it a little bit. But, you know, while you have it and while you're feeling good, especially young people, you know, thank God for that good health, the strength that God gives day by day. He's the author, isn't it? The Bible says it's in Him we move, right, live, move, and have our being. So it's because of God that we are here today, and I just I want to praise Him and thankful for another Sabbath day. Last week we talked about aiming high. If you'll remember, just recall back a few moments. Aim, aiming high because there's something better. We established several points. I hope that you can remember. If not, we talked a little bit about success in this life and then the success in the life to come. And uh, do we need to be motivated? Do we need a definite aim when it comes to our Christian experience? And I think some of the answers are very plain that we need to be motivated. And if we need to be motivated, what motivates us? There's things in the world that motivate us into doing different things. Uh, the enemy knows very well, especially with our young people, how to motivate them to do the wrong things. But also God knows how to motivate us into doing the right things. It comes down to personal choices and personal decision. And uh, we, need, we need that definite aim. We talked about influence. We talked about faith and works. And we read one a paragraph from Youth Instructor, a little pamphlet, Youth Instructor, written in 1890, it said this. Now again, notice this because it lays the foundation of what we'll talk about again today. It says, every action derives its quality from the motive which prompts it. Now are we all on the same thinking plane here? Every action... So that means everything that we do, isn't that right? Everything that we do, everything that we say, every action derives its quality from the motive which prompts it. Now, if the motive, reading on, are not high and pure, now notice this, and this is difficult, unselfish, the mind and the character will never become well balanced. Maybe that's why we have a problem being balanced in this life and we find a lot of people that we think, and certainly not ourselves, but they're unbalanced. Do you ever notice how many people are unbalanced but we're okay? It seems that way because we look around, well, they're just, they're just not balanced. And that doesn't have to necessarily mean anything wrong with them mentally. It just means they have a hard time balancing things. Have you ever had a difficult time balancing issues of life? I think we all have. What would we do today without God's Word? How would we balance everyday life? How would we balance how we treat one another? How would we balance our, our work and our, our rest and our relationship with God, our relationship with one another? How would we balance the important things of life without God's Word? Well, I think it would be impossible. But it's very imperative, according to God's Word, that we become balanced Christians. Not just one-sided, not just you know, focused in one direction. And in Adventism, that's very easy to do that. We find them every wind of doctrine blowing in Adventism. Many people have just one thought on their mind and uh, you know, one subject, and that's all that they ever talk about. 
Well, friend, I know it's important, and it may be an important subject, but I think that's unbalanced in the cause of Christ because there's so many issues that we need to be looking at. There's so many things Scripture offers us, and it's just not one subject all of the time. God's bigger than that, isn't it? He's better than that, and He offers us much, much more. There's a lot of discouraging things that are going on uh, you know, in Adventism, and sometimes we, we have to mention some of those things. You know, one of the most discouraging things to me, and again, people take it differently, and I, maybe that's okay for you to do, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a real believer that God has led in this church and Behold the Lamb Church for, for many years. Uh, he called us out of one area of the, we call it the organized, even though an independent it should be organized the structure to an independent ministry, I believe that God had a hand in it. In fact, I know that God had a hand in it. And many of you here from maybe just right at the beginning, you've seen the hand. You've seen the things that God had worked out. So we were either being led by God or were by some other spirit. And we choose to believe based on His Word once again and balancing Scripture that God led us from one direction to in another direction. Not His Word, not the change, but we begin to see things that were different. Things that maybe we hadn't seen before. we seen different problems and we've seen different things in that which we, we had loved for many years within the structure. And then we begin to find that those things were not really balancing with God's Word and a change needed to take place. May I say to you that I never personally, and some of you, I'm sure everyone feels that, you didn't look for that change. You weren't looking for some reason just to make a change. and uh, You didn't want to be involved with these, uh, you know, another group. You didn't want to be involved with it, you know, just reach out and say, well, I want to be. You never look for anything, any reason, but God began to reveal right and wrong. And he began to have you to balance the word. As you balanced the word, you saw that it didn't fit in some of these areas here. And then you were led to make a choice or a decision to maybe make a change in the church that you attended. Sad to say that there are many who are returning, who professed for many years that God was leading in the direction to bring them to the point where they were at in their ministry and in their walk with Him, and then several years later, they begin to say, well, I need to return, and I, may I say this nicely, to Egypt. See, so return back to those things that God had led them out of. Now that should be enough red flag for any of us to begin to challenge those issues to say, for those years we were saying God was leading us, evidently He wasn't because we're right back where we started 10, 15 years ago. And let me tell you, 10 or 15 years have passed by. It's only become worse, not better. Now, say critical if you want to, and it may be because our minds are not balanced. Or you can might say that it's informative, that it's a fact. And if these things are a fact, God expects us then to you know, blow the trumpet and give it a certain sound. So if it's not any better in the place that God has called you out of 10 or 15 years ago, what, and it's gotten worse... Why are you going back? Why are many in multitudes going back? And the letter that was read in Sabbath school that prompts this this morning, and I'm going to be able to address this once again in a few weeks. It'll not be any different than things that we've taught from up here before, but maybe as a reminder, because it does make a difference on the stance that you take and I take. It makes a difference where you go to church. It makes a difference what you believe. It makes a difference with God. In this letter that was read in Sabbath school class that many of you were here and you heard part of it, I just, I'll, I'll skip some of it here, but I, I want to read part of it. It comes from uh, the Colorado. It's a very interesting letter. And it talks about a scattered flock in the, the Denver, Colorado area. And it said, without, what would they do without the true and faithful ministries that are out there? And they wrote this to Behold the Lamb, and I, I praise God for that, that we can be, by His grace and strength, continue to send out what we believe is truth. It's very important that we do, because letters like this to say, where would we be? It starts out, says, I must say, what 
would the scattered flock here in Denver area do without the true and faithful ministry? There's a ministry that, there is a ministry that needs to be lifted up by prayer and support it there. And notice this. They knew this. The devil has tried to destroy it. But we must not let it happen. And it says here, BTLM, the ministry, this church, you are a vital connection to us through the power of God. And then they sent a letter and they said regarding this letter, there's, this leaves us bewildered by the choices made by a few of historic Seventh-day Adventist movements. I'm wondering if you would lay out some Bible principles regarding these issues. Here are people who do not have a church to go to every week. You may not be thankful for the church that you have, but you will be someday when you don't have it. And sad that it might come to that for a few. The blessings that we receive from one another. Oh, dear friends, you know, count your blessings, name them one by one. Whether it be a, a large number or a small number, I'm telling you, it's a blessing to gather with brothers and sisters. And it's not until many folks have taken a very difficult position to where they had rather stay in their home by themselves, study God's Word by themselves, rather than go to a place who has let down the standards. You are a peculiar person. You are a different. You're what God describes as His peculiar people because you are different. Because you dare to take certain stands on certain issues. And God wants you to continue to be peculiar. He wants you to be different. He wants you to be special. And it's easier to gather information when you're around a group sometime. And other times it becomes more difficult because you have more minds more thoughts, more ideas, and, you know, some battles that have to be fought line upon line. But here are some people, they are not affiliated or, uh, you know, where they can fellowship week in and week out. So sometimes they need help. They need somebody to give them direction, maybe from a distance. And they're saying, we, we are bewildered by the choices several have made. They just can't understand why. And so they asked for this. I won't read the rest of the letter, but we praise God for it because, you know, they're saying here, we're, they're, they're uplifted by this church and the church family here and said, what a breath of fresh air for us. Well, praise God for that. True and faithful member, you know, took a stand on some issues and they were disfellowshipped by taking a stand on some things they felt was truth and, and right. And then they send this letter here. It's a long letter. I won't read all of it here. But most of you will understand and know in here. It makes me in my mind to ask the question is why? Why would it prompt someone to do this? This is uh, May the 17th, so several months ago here this year. And this, this was uh, written by, and, and it's okay to do it because they sent it all out here. Modern Manna, that's Danny Vieira. Most of us know we, you know, our church supported, you know, St. Louis and giving out books and so on and so forth on here. One, two, three, four pages. You can see how closely it's written. So there's a lot here. And he starts it out like this. Dear friends of Modern Manor, perhaps now many of you have heard that my family and I have rejoined the church. The structure. So leaving the independent work and going back to the, the conference is something that is... And then he goes on to say, you know, and he's going to tell you why. I'm writing this letter to share with you the circumstances that led to making this decision. You know, and I tried to be as open as I could, and I read all the letter, and there's, there's nothing in here. I consider him a good friend. I know he will hear this, and it still will be my plea to him because I think it's still right, is I don't understand. You write four pages and maybe hundreds of words and I tried to read it with an open mind to try to get something that would give me a basis on which to try to understand. And there's a good background of his life and how he became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and the ministry and so on and so forth and a friendship with an individual here named Dan and uh, you know all the, all the stuff that took place here but uh, I really never seen anything for any reasons of, of changing positions. 
at this time. And so I become baffled along with this letter is why are we changing? Has God not led in the past? And if He has and we felt it of a necessity then to make changes, then why does why it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter now. The choices that we make, what we believe. And I sense in the letter, as I sense of a lot of people who are going back that have talked to me about it, they just said, you know, I. That uh, we need to have, you know, more love and more compassion and more understanding. And he says in here, he looks back over the, you know, some of the the bold things that were said and done in the past and just wondered how, you know, how that, that was accomplished and how it was done. Maybe sees things a little bit differently right now. But, you know, I, I just. You know, I want him to continue to pray. You know, I love him. I think it was a powerful voice, uh, the background and the way of conversion and how God brought him into this marvelous light and associated him with, with structure, with independent, as it were, with truth. And he could see it so clearly several years ago of what truth, what truth is. And the position that had to be taken in order to, to, to please God. But for some reason now, that has changed. And now it doesn't matter. Now, I want to submit something here. And again, I realize that that will be seen and heard. And it's okay because I'm not trying to say or do anything that I would not do or say to to Him. But some of the direction sometimes you can see is, is the fellowship that we keep. The company that we keep. And even in all the good work and so on and so forth for several years, I could see it drifting from this individual over here who did not know the three angels' message. Maybe they had a good part of the health work that we could use. But in our own life too, you can see a drifting when our friends and our company we keep and our fellowship is always of those of different faith or different belief or even of the world. When we keep that kind of company, and a lot of times that's good, good people that, you know, that, that maybe love Jesus in their own right. But if we're not careful, we will be swayed to say that it really doesn't make a difference as long as we just love Jesus and you know, preach a good message and so on and so forth. But you know, my Bible doesn't teach that when it gives the Revelation 14 message of the three angels. There's a message that is given in there that will will purify a people, that will change your heart and your life, that will test you as a Christian to see how much you love Jesus. I believe the angels in heaven are different than we are down here. What do you think? There's a difference in heaven. And down here, God's children should be different than the rest of the world. That will be in what we say, the way that we talk, the way we dress, the way we eat, the way we react. God's looking for a peculiar people and we become muddled in this mess of not knowing or giving direction. Well, this place is pretty good over here, this right here. Friend, friend, God is looking and He's trying to reach you and me today to say it does make a difference where you worship, where you attend what you lend your body to, to where you go, it makes a difference. Our excuse always is, well, they're preaching the truth over there. If they're preaching the truth, they're going to call sin by its right name inside and outside of the church. Are you with me? If they're not calling sin by its right name inside the church, they're not doing the job God's given us to do. Only those who call sin by its right name inside and outside the church will receive of the latter rain. And it's not happening. And so we defend a lot of times these things and we continue on. I'm baffled like these folks when a person says who, who gave some of the best definitions of who and what the church is that in a few short years can turn around and say, we've rejoined the church. Are you with me? 
If you do not, and it's very simple to understand who and what the church is. The church is not Seventh-day Adventist church. It is not the conference. It's not independent ministries. That's not, the Bible is very clear of His church. It's His people who love Him, who keep His commandments, who's willing to do His will, who's willing to be different than the world. His messenger even says very clearly that it's not the churches. Isn't that right? It's not the buildings. And yet somehow when we retreat and we go back where we say God has led us out of all these years and we go back into it and it's, remember, worse than it was before. Could it be that maybe we're, spiritually we're dying? Because we really maybe don't see it and we give excuses for why we're going back. Or would it be better for us to fellowship alone rather than to support that which we know is wrong? See, God's calling us into action today. There's something that motivated you to be here, something that's motivated me. Something motivated you into accepting this message. There must have been something that you heard, that you've seen, that you studied, that began to motivate you to say, wow, this is different than the way I was taught. This is different than the way mom and dad taught me. This is not the religion of my parents or my grandparents. In fact, I, didn't, I don't know a whole lot about it, but this seems to be on target. It seems to be God speaking to me when I read the Word and I want to know what truth is. Something has to motivate you and me in life to do the right thing, even if you're the only one that's going to do it. See, this old story of, well, there's, there's only one or two of us here, so we'll just go on back and join the group. That's so flimsy. Now, I can understand that because we like fellowship. We want to be with people. But to know it's a wrong thing to do to go back and then say, well, I just, we just, I just need some fellowship, so I'll go. Why not pray that God brings you the right kind of fellowship? Maybe He's asking you to lead out in some kind. There needs to be some action. I, I had a chemistry teacher years ago, and, and he, uh, very seldom did he ever make any sense to me. Is anybody with me? All Greek to me in a chemistry class. A lot of times I spent time down the library rather than the chemistry class for some reason. But he made a couple of points, and you know, I don't care where the points come from, if they're, if they're good, if they're backed by God's Word, if there's principle there, we need to listen. I mean, it's like he wasn't around sometime, even though he was there. Some of you met people like that. Almost too smart, you know? But he, he made some real good, good, good points to me. He had come in there in the class, he'd greet the class and so on there, and, he'd, and, you, and some of you, who you kind of know who's interested and who's not. You know why some are there. Now, this is in high school, so there's a difference, you know? He'd look at the class, look everybody over and look down, and he'd say, well, there's... You know, here, 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 here's the scenario right here. Here's the way it's going to be. This is the first of the year, first day you're in there. Here's the way it is. Are some of you in here because you have no choice? I'm looking around. Boy, I don't think I'm one of those, you know. I wonder how he knew me so well. You know, you didn't have to choose or something you're going to have to, you took, so you think you're in here. You know, that's what it, and then there's the very few that's in here that are here because they want to be here. And let me tell you, those who want to be here are those who will go on with their schooling. So you have those who are not going to college and those who are going to college. So, well, boy, put that kind of... And he put like this, there's a very few in here who's going to want to make something of yourself. The rest of you are just wanting to get by. And he said, you know what, I'll do my very best to get you by and get you out of here. So he asked Charlie McAuley in there, as the English teacher did one time, he said, uh, Charlie, why don't you pay attention? Charlie said, because I don't care. Sometimes we say that when God speaks to us, well, I don't care. I don't want to know. Don't you want to make something of yourself, Charlie? Nope, I already know what I'm going to be. Well, how can you be so sure? I already know what, what are you going to be, Charlie. I'm going to be a trucker just like my dad. I'm going to have me a backhoe 
and I'm going to truck. And you know what? That's exactly what he did. Sometimes we have our minds set, even when we're young, about the direction life, you know, what's going to throw at us, and this is what we're going to take. It could have changed. It could have been different. He chose. So he said, I don't need English. I don't need chemistry because I already know how to drive a truck and run a backhoe. And that's why I'm going to make it left. He limited himself. How about us? We limit ourselves. If some of us are here because, and it may be a young person, it because, well, I, don't, I didn't have a choice. See, most of us in here, you had a choice. Because you want to move on. You don't want this world to be, right, your home, you're, you're moving on. This world's not my home. May I say you're in that graduating class. You know, how far wrong was this man, at least in principle? Review in Harold, May 17th and 1898, says every course of action has a twofold character and importance. I never really thought about it like this. You know, every, every action, everything that we go to do and so on, every, it's a twofold character and importance. Why? Because she says this, because one, it is either virtuous or it's vicious. Motives, somebody with me? Motives of the heart. Motives of the heart. Everything we go to do for someone else, for God, for ourselves, family, friends, whatever it might be, there's twofold. It's either going to be virtuous, it's going to be right. We're doing it from the right motives because we want to, or it could be vicious. And that means if it's not virtuous, vicious sounds like a horrible word, but that's what it is. If it's not from Jesus, it's what? It's from the enemy. And then makes it a little clear. She goes on and said, every action that we, that we take, it's either right or it's wrong. See, there is no middle ground. It's either right or it's wrong. And it says it's according to the motive that prompt it. It's according to the motive that prompts it. Now you think about that for a minute. Everything you go to do for the day, every decision you make, twofold character. It's going to be right or it's going to be wrong. It's going to lead you down the wrong path. It's going to lead you in the right path. Let me ask you a question here and then be careful how you answer it. That's why we probably won't, you know. Again, how many people really want to be successful in this life? Now think about it. Is it really important to be successful in this life? Now there's a lot of different answers and your, your thought pattern will, may be a little bit different here. But how many want to be successful in this life? I mean, you have to really think about it. Review and Herald, August 19th, 1884, makes this statement that's interesting. The question is, is asked and then it's, it's answered. It says, what is the aim or what is the purpose of your life? See, that's valid today even. What is the purpose, what is the aim of your life? Because if you think you're here just to occupy, mm -mm. there's something after this life. There's something beyond this life. And then what? We're aiming low. We have no purpose. We're not motivated. We don't want to do anything. We don't want to accomplish anything. We don't want to be a success as it were in this life. What's, what's wrong? She simply says that what, this is very interesting. When you're searching out these things, aim high. Subject matter here, what? Aim high, spare no pains to reach the standard. See, even in our Christian walk, we need a standard. In our schooling, we need a standard. In our home life, we need a standard. In our job, we need a standard. We all understand with standard, there must, be a, there must be something that we aim for, that we shoot for. And still this, it doesn't matter. Who cares? It doesn't make a difference. It makes a difference, dear friends. I used to tell Jeremy years and years ago when he was at home, I said, Jeremy, pay attention. I'll put this simple, when we change a light bulb. Are you with me? When your dad changed a light bulb, pay attention because the time will come... If you don't know how to do it, you'll have to hire somebody. Somebody with me? Not quite that. You know, saw a board. Pay attention. See? Because one of these days you may be sawing your own boards for your own home. 
you know. Learn how to read a tape. Learn how to cut rafters. Learn how to do some of these things. A little bit. Less. Well, you know, at that time you don't feel like, well, that's not. Who cares? But he will probably be first to tell you, as probably many of you learned lessons. We wished we'd have paid a little more attention to the plumbing and the electrical and a lot of other things in life because it comes back and you can use those things. Education process, on and on and on. Reach the standard. Now, friend, the Bible, what about a Bible standard? Numbers 115. Turn back with your Bibles in your Old Testament quickly. There's just a few minutes left, but I want you to see about a little bit of a standard here quickly this morning. In the book of Numbers, chapter 1, verse 52. Now notice what God was speaking to the children of Israel here. And He's speaking to you and He's speaking to me today in verse 52 of Numbers chapter 1. He says, And the children of Israel shall pitch their what? Tents. Every man by his own camp and every man by his own standard throughout their what? host. God wants everything to be done decently and in order. And God set it up in order. So He said, I want you to go and go by what? Stand by your standard. And you think about, well, you know, the standards is here. You know, the name several of the tribes. There were 12 tribes in it, right? Judah, underneath their standard, which was their flag. Isn't that right? Sometimes you can take a flag on a pole and you can lift it way up where people can see it from a distance. See, if the flag's held way down here about face high, some of us short, he's not going to see anything. If somebody lifts the standard, it gives us what? I don't know which way to go. Oh, I see the standard. I see the flag. Oh, I know I'm heading in that direction. So the standard here is something that gives direction. Even when you're lost, you can see it. It gives you direction, and you know what direction to start going in. See, Judah, you read in the Bible, I think on that flag, many people have said that was the, that was the lion on that. Jesus was referred to what? Lion, the tribe of, of Judah. So the 12 tribes, you can just go right through. Uh, Reuben, the tribe of Reuben, around there they had a figure of a man that was on there. And so the people who were with the tribe of, of Reuben, when they saw this, they knew where they were supposed to gather and they didn't dilly-dally around. They went underneath that, that standard. Ephraim, Another tribe on there, they had, their, they had a picture of an ox that was on there. So they knew when they saw this, men, women, children, all, this is where they belong. This is where they better gather. And when there was hundreds of thousands of people, how important it is to have order and discipline. I think the tribe of Dan had, a, had an eagle on it. So just a standard is raised gives us what? Direction. You look it up in the uh, dictionary... And I like one of the meanings on it. It says something conspicuous. Standard, something conspicuous. You see, we need something conspicuous. We need something that stands out. We need direction. We need to know which way to go. We need to know who to follow. What to follow. Standard, standards in, in the world. And in Numbers here where we read, every man by his own standard, that's exactly... In the, in the Hebrew, it, it simply means a flag or it means a banner. So everyone go stand under his own what? Banner. And remember, there's only two banners in this world today. And that banner, one of them has the commandments of men on it. And one has the commandments of God on it. And we're going to stand under one or the other. Ellen White says it like this right here. There's that white banner that has the commandments of God and testimony of Jesus on it. Over here there's a black banner over here that has the commandments of men on it. And the majority of the world is standing underneath that one. Because Jesus said very plainly in Matthew 15, wasn't he? He said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In vain do they worship me. So we need a standard today. We need a, we need a flag. We need a, we need a sail. We need some kind of a signal. In Isaiah chapter 59 verse 19. Look at this again. It gives us a little more insight. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 19. 
Isaiah 59, 19 says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. Notice this. When the enemy shall come in like a what? A flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a what? A standard against Him. The Lord's going to lift up a standard that's going to put the enemy to flight when it comes against God's people. Isn't that wonderful? But there has to be a standard there. God wants to be known that He is God. And friends, how often have we put Him on the same, you know, level as man? He's God. He said, I'll put Him to, I'll put him to, to flight here. I'll put Him to flight. To flee, lift up the standard. They, they, they disperse. Jeremiah 51, 27, right there close by. Notice what it says. Jeremiah chapter 51... I look up a couple of these quickly. Jeremiah 51 verse 27 says, Set ye up a what? A standard. Jeremiah 51 27. Set up a standard in the land and then do what? Blow the trumpet among the nations. See, we're to set up a standard. A signal. There's to be a flag. There's to be a banner on it. You know, and a lot of times we, we hide behind the standard. We're afraid to say Seventh-day Adventist movement. We're afraid to let it know that we're Sabbath keepers. Because it's not popular. Jesus tells it here, set up a standard where? In the land and then blow the trumpet. You set that standard up, you have direction. You know what banner you're supposed to be under and don't be embarrassed about it. You can blow the trumpet and let the world know where you stand. God's looking for men and women just like that. We're preparing for battle, friends. I'm telling you, battle that we have not seen, that we've not been involved with before, and we probably are not ready spiritually for that battle, and we need to ask God to help us. Put up a standard. Friend, are you a standard bearer today? See, some standard bearers today, as I've read in this letter here, some people that I figure are standard bearers that's going to lift the standard. Some of them are letting that standard down. Who's going to pick up that standard? Or the message that's sent out today to literally hundreds and thousands of people to say, well, he... He thinks it's all right to do this, so I guess it's probably all right for us to do it. See, if it's just one individual that's involved, it might be a little different. Even though one individual is very important. But when it encompasses maybe hundreds or thousands making decisions and we're beginning to get weak because we don't hear these messages anymore, we've forgotten that it makes a difference about our standard. Friend, may I in the last few minutes... Lift up a standard to you and me today. God gives us that standard and you know it very well. Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, here's the standard that God gives for His people today. And we need to get ourselves underneath that banner. That, that protection. Think about it, friend. That protection. God's law is holiness made known to man. People talk about the law, you know, is with Mount Sinai and all that. Oh, friend, don't you know the law was in operation? God's law before Adam and Eve because it could not affect Adam and Eve. There wasn't a law before. So it had to be. Not exactly as we know the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But it was the law of heaven that governed heaven. God had it there in principle. And after sin, then God instituted in 10. That would deal with man who had fallen into sin. But the principle never changed. Praise God for that. It never changed. And so God says to lift up these, the, the holy precepts here. In Exodus chapter 20, He talks about here in verse 1, And God spake these words, saying, I am the Lord, what? Thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. What was God doing? What was He doing here to the people? Were they happy because they were coming out of bondage? Oh, you better believe it to be in that kind of servitude, dear friend. That kind of bondage, that slavery. And then to be set free. He said what? You didn't work your way out of it. You never earned it. What? It's a gift just like salvation is. He said you can't earn it. Right? It's not. I'm giving it to you. So he reminds us. 
that it's free. He says, I am the one that brought you out of Egypt and out of the house of, of bondage. And so when God says, I'm the one that's done this, I've delivered you out of this mess over here. And then he looks at his people and he says, now because of, these, because of me taking care of you, I want you to have no other gods before me. He knew they'd been right in the midst of all these other strange gods. And when you're in the midst of a lot of strange gods, you begin to get watered down as somebody with me. Some of the points we were talking about earlier. We begin to get watered down because of our association and the contact and the people that we're around all the time. Sin doesn't seem like sin. Wrong doesn't seem like wrong because these are good people and they think it's all right. When God says this come apart, let's look at it and let's see where it leads. Where's the good in it? Some always say, well, what's wrong with it? Well, what's good with it? When you like someone to come and say, what's, what's good with this thing? Rather than, what, well, what's wrong if I go here? It's always what's wrong. He said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And he goes on down and he lists the commandments right here. And you know what? This is his banner. We have to have a standard that has to be raised when he says in verse you know, 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And he gets specific. He says, In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Oh, friend, how important this is to those who are in the home, mom and dad. Mom and dad are Sabbath keepers. You have children maybe that come that are not. You still should not let them go out and mow the lawn for you. You shouldn't let them paint the house. You shouldn't let them be repairing the faucets or whatever it might be. Now, if that's happened to anybody, I don't know that. I just heard about Brother Jan and, right, and Brother Richard. I'm talking Brother Richard and Sister Jan about their bathroom experience during the week. So if anybody else had family over, I don't know. But here, that, you get the point? It says right here, you're not to do any work, nor what? The son's not to, or the daughter's not to, or the manservant, or the maidservant, nor the cattle, nor the stranger. Well, he's a stranger. We'll go ahead and let him work. No. Why? You're responsible for that which God has given you. And you are not to let anyone do any work on your property or what you own on that day because God said no. Whether they believe it or not, you are the one that's responsible. Does that make sense? He's given it to you. It's not anybody else's. God holds you accountable for that. And then he goes on to say, for in six days, right, what he did, he, he blessed the seventh day and he hollowed it. What kind of purpose, what kind of aim do you have today? And where are we really focused? Where's our heart? Where's our mind? Where's our, where's our standard of conduct and our standard of, of taste at today? Standard of excellence. I've often wondered about the most important thing that we could do as far as education is, is concerned. And I read this in the Review and Herald, October 24, 1907. I'm talking about an essential education or part most important part of education, which is, is, a, is a large area. It says it needs to be, it's an education that will teach us how to reveal the will of God to the world. The most important education that you need to receive and I need to receive in this life is how to reveal the will of God to the world. The world is perishing, dear friends, for lack of that knowledge. They're dying today. Thousands will die and go to a Christless grave because we have not been doing our work. May God help us to see that. The most essential knowledge that you could have that you want to obtain is what? The knowledge of God. The will of God. Knowledge of God. The one who, who sent Him. Knowledge of Jesus. Oh, friend, how we need this. So how high should you aim today? How high should I aim Inspiration makes it, and I'll paraphrase it, it says, just as high as humanity and divinity. Well, how far can divinity? Huh? As high as you want to aim by faith with the divine help, dear friends, we can hit the target. So the standard today is what? Is Jesus. It's not one another. 
The standard is we to be raising in the church is the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, right? Keeping the law, the seventh day Sabbath, by His grace and His strength. Oh, friend, what a standard. It's not the time to be lowering the standard to say it doesn't make a difference anymore. All we need is more love and more encouragement and more... Yes, we need all of those things, but we have to be aware of the hour in which we are living. We must be aware of that so that we can be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Inspiration puts it something like this. Remember, once again, we purpose in our heart that we know nothing except of giving what? Nothing should occupy our time or our mind except the giving of the three angels' message. Now, how often we've let other things occupy our mind? Why? Because the three angels' message is the testing message of this world. There will not be another message that will come. This is the message, just like there wasn't another message at the time of the flood. The message was preached. The message was given. Probation closed. Not another person went into that ark. Men, women, children, babies were lost. Now think about it. That's a, that's a horrible thing, but one of these days, what, probation is going to close, and then what? Where will we spend eternity? Are we making the best decisions we can with the information that we have today? I pray that you are. I pray that I am. But you know what? We need divine power in our hearts and in our lives today. But I'm going to encourage you today, do not retreat toward Egypt. And I try to say that as nicely as I can. It helps us to understand it. And where God has led you, dear friends, and positively read, uh, led you, shown you great and marvelous things, could it be that God was wrong all that time? Could it be that God is making those mistakes? And now we have to go back and say, man, all these years have been a mistake. Now I need to go back. Oh, friend, no. God doesn't make mistakes. We do. Let's ask God to help. It's never too late while there's breath to aim high. And by God's grace, let's aim high by faith, shall we? As far as what? High as the human and divine combined together. And friend, that means heaven. Our standard, right, our objective is Jesus Christ. And let's, let's focus on that this week, shall we? Let's not get depressed. Let's not get down and out. Let's stay focused on why we're here, what our message is, and what we should be giving to the world and what we need in our own lives to be ready when Jesus shall come. Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? Oh, absolutely. If not, this life is in vain. If we're not ready to meet Jesus, then what? We're here for a few short moments and then what? We're gone. We need to learn to focus on the real things, the things that are most important in life. And then what? Then make a plan. Aim high. And you know what? God will be there for you. And He'll encourage you and He will strengthen you to be ready when He shall come. That's our prayer today. And if it is, let's kneel, shall we, as we pray together. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for encouraged us by faith to reach out and to tackle those things that seem impossible with man. The Word tells us all things are possible with you. We ask you to forgive us of where we have aimed so low. That seemed like without a vision the people perish. We've had no vision, no, no real hope, no real encouragement, and we've let the standard down. I pray thy Holy Spirit will come in the midst of us, even still yet at this moment, encourage us that someone needs to be lifting the standard higher. Not lower, but higher and higher and higher. And with that information that you give us over and over, that it needs to be lifted higher, and yet we find many in Adventism are lowering it, lowering it, lowering it. It says it makes no difference, but the majority seems to go after the lower standard. We need a spiritual revival. We pray thy Holy Spirit will revive each of our hearts and our lives. Help us to understand that each one of us that God wants us to play an important role in help finishing this work. But number one is to be ready ourselves, And as we spend time with you, then you'll have us to go out and to help others. 
And I thank you, you've given us the privilege of lifting that standard. Help us, Lord, to hold it high. That others may see not any individual, but they, may they see Jesus. You said in your word, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. May that be our prayer, our aim today. Thank you for the precious souls that's here today. May we be again encouraged and revived to know we are here for a definite purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.